We all long for happiness. It's the thing we most dream for. Hail to the altruistic revolution. Let's go for it. Now the first exercise is just gonna get us ready for the big finale. Hello, everyone. Please do me a favor and turn to someone on your le left and give them an aloha. <laughs> and someone on your right and offer them a bonjour. <laughs> a little micro moment of positivity resonance a la Barbara Fredrickson. The day my younger brother died, February 28, 2011, I was 50, he was 48, stage four pancreatic cancer, 10 weeks from diagnosis to death. That morning when the hospice nurse slid her hand off of his wrist for the last time and said, it's done. Well, a little after, I, I couldn't stay in the house and I walked out my brother's front door to the stone walkway and looked up at the beautiful North Carolina spring sky and saw the dogwood tree redolent with pink blossoms and I heard a sound, a new sound. You see, my brother lived about a quarter kilometer from the school where his four teenagers attended and within minutes of his passing, his children were doing this. And the sound I heard was the sound of sneakers and sandals coming up the walkway from the neighbor's house across the street without hall pass or permission slip. My nieces and nephews' friends came to comfort their friends. Mother Teresa said, we can do no great things, we can only do small things with great love. And that morning, great love entered my brother's house in t-shirts and jeans. And I thought to myself, this is definitely gonna be the best moment of this day. Why is it important to pay attention to the best moment on a dark day? Or more broadly, why is happiness important to focus on in our most difficult moments? That's probably the question I am asked most often these days. What is the point, really? Isn't happen happiness illusory? Isn't it somewhat delusional? Ought, ought we not be spending most of our time protecting and defending and developing our core strength? Isn't it just silly? And I suggest to you this. You know, what's funny about that is that we all long for happiness. It's the thing we most dream for. It, we, we, we long for its, its, its light, its sun, its oxygen. It's the thing we most want for the children we care for, those who are coming after us. And yet we sometimes get confused about why it is significant even when bombs explode in Manchester or vans drive into crowds of people or people lose their way. And I suggest to you that to have a life that is rich and sustaining personally, to fill us with the vitality and the energy we need to go out and bring the beautiful altruism that Matthew was talking about to our, to serve in the way we are here to serve in order to have that, we must pay attention to the good, to the best. We must elevate happiness. So first, a definition. This is from Tal Ben-Shahar, Harvard professor, one of our world thought leaders. He comes to help us understand that happiness is really a balance of two things, both positive emotions, pleasure, positive states, and meaning. Just let's do a little survey. How many people in the room think a little more pleasure in their life might not be a bad thing? How about a little more meaning? How about a little more both? Right. You see, pleasure brings us present benefit. It makes the day a day worth living. Meaning brings us both present benefit and future benefit. It makes a life one worth living. And it turns out if we have a life that is only pleasure, think uh, first year in university, life eventually it begins to feel empty and we seek to fill the emptiness and we often make the mistake of trying to fill it with more, more stuff, more gambling, more traveling, more buying, more sexing, more sexting, more texting, more, 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 more. If life is only meaning and no pleasure, life eventually becomes to be experienced as burdensome. Many of the nurses, social workers, attorneys, physicians I work with have this experience. Tremendous meaning, not a lot of joy. And we become in that state world weary. And in states of either extreme of burdenness 
or emptiness. We do not have the capacity within to not only fill ourselves, but fill the world with our gifts and our strengths. Happiness is crucial. The first benefit of bringing forward positivity in a dark time is that of respite. And here is our wonderful Matthew. In moments of per perfect happiness, such as walking in the serene wilderness by oneself, off into the forest or even out into the desert, we let go of the mental constructs that are bothering us. We don't worry about the future. We let go of the past, the hold of the past. And we are simply present here and now, this moment of respite from which all sense of emotional urgency has vanished is experienced as one of profound peace. We are in sanctuary within ourselves. And in the darkest moments, we need sanctuary. We need this serenity. The second benefit to emerge from focusing on positive, the good, even in the midst of our most stressful stressful weeks or our most catastrophic days is that of hope. When my brother passed after his funeral, I returned back home and I thought, well, I've got to do something to demonstrate to my children that I can be distraught and shattered and also still present and alive. And so for 13 months, every morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, I got up to put on MTV and VH1 to dance privately in my den because they wouldn't be awake and they wouldn't make fun of me. And every now and then, at 6 o'clock in the morning on MTV, John Bon Jovi shows up. <laughs> Hope emerges as we integrate positivity. <laughs> hope. This is, and I, the definition I use for hope is, it comes to us from Rick Snyder's uh, theory of both the, the willpower, the volition, the desire to create a slightly better future, and the way power, the path, the strategy to create a slightly better future. My first uh, significant evidence of this came to me early on in my training working at a cancer hospital for children with cancer in Boston, Massachusetts. I met a young girl named Gwen who was in for leg amputation. She had bone cancer and we were going to amputate below the right knee. Gwen was about eight years old. And we, in the clinic room we worked in, there was every single possible toy and game and puppet and kit you could imagine. And I showed her the room and said, what would you like to do? And she said, oh, we need to practice hopping. And I said, well, hopping? Turns out she's an older sister, and her great joy in life was to compete with her younger brother and beat him at running and skipping and hopping and playing races. And she'd figured out if she only had a leg and a half, she ought to get really good at hopping. So five days a week for three weeks before the surgery, I was ordered to hold my right leg up, and we hopped through the center, down the river walk, and so on. Hope, the volition and the strategy to create a slightly better future, even as we are losing a part of ourselves. And this shows evidence of the work we know from Barbara Fredrickson's The Broaden and Build Theory, that in states of positivity, our capacity to bring together new pieces of information to see the whole and integrate it in new ways expands. And supported by work of Richard Boyatzis and his colleagues who work with Fortune 100 executives around the world. I love it when the business research matches up beautifully with the psychological research, which matches up beautifully with the wisdom teachings of our greatest thinkers and feelers in the world. In states of positivity, we are cooperative, altruistic, conciliatory, creative. We expand our capacity to live in the moment and create something significant. From this, we see evidence of resilience. This is Janine Shepard, who many of you may know. Janine, in 1986, was preparing for her Olympic cross-country ski race. She was training in uh, New South Wales on a bike run for her just before they, the team was to head off to the Olympics. And in the middle of the training run, suddenly she wakes up in hospital, having been struck by a truck, multiple life-threatening organ and spinal cord injuries. Janine is in the spinal ward for months. She returns home eventually in a full body brace and catheter bag still not knowing if she will ever walk without great assistance. And one day she looks up, sees an aeroplane overhead, and thinks to herself, if I can't walk, 
I might as well fly. That was my best Australian accent. <laughs> she then goes on to become a small engine plane pilot, a large engine plane pilot, an aeronautic plane pilot, and become a teacher of pilots. I learned that she recently was given the Order of Australia, this country's highest award. And here we too see resilience, this broadening and building of capacity, even in darkness, through Sherry Mandel. Sherry Mandel is an American who, with her husband, made Aliyah to Israel to raise their children. And in May of 2001, her oldest son, Kobe, skipped school for the day, the first time he had ever done so, to play in the caves near his home in Tekoa with his best friend, and then sadly, they were very bad men in those caves. It was wartime, and the two boys were stoned to death. Within the year of the loss of her son, Kobe, Sherry and her husband, Seth, formed the Kobe Mandel Foundation, a foundation to gather together families who have lost loved ones to war or to terror. And after their first three-day retreat in Jerusalem in which they offered these families art and music and song and dancing and massage and healing, on the way home, her daughter Eliana piped up from the back of the car and said, Mama, you know what I love best about our retreat? And she said, what, sweetie? It's like we all came with broken bits of heart and together we made a new big heart. This is resilience, the capacity to adapt to stress or trauma or loss healthfully. And in these stories, I hope you begin to see evidence of the second element of our definition of happiness, Tal Ben-Shahar's definition, that of meaning. This is the beautiful, your beautiful Sydney Opera House. Notice the, the art the heart and the architecture. You see, meaning gives an architecture to suffering, an order, a structure, a plan. When we bring meaning alive, we find a way to integrate that which has brought us to our knees and create the possibility of becoming eventually, not immediately, not right away, but eventually slightly larger than the suffering. We find a way to hold the brokenness and still hold on to what is good. Here now we are in the realm of paradox. This is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Niels Bohr, once said, the opposite of a falsehood is a truth, but the opposite of a profound truth is often another profound truth. So the image I would like you to hold as you consider happiness in dark times is this image, a broken bowl repaired with golden lacquer. The story is told <clears throat> that in the 15th century, a Japanese shogun by the name of Yoshi Masha had a favored bowl that shattered, and he sent the bowl to China for repairs, which was the custom of its time. And the bowl returned to him, repaired with ugly metal staples. And in despair over the lack of the fineness of the bowl, he challenged the artisans near him to come up with a finer form. And one created a form in which a bowl broken was laced with golden lacquer. And the art form kintsugi became so popular that it became a philosophy. And the philosophy is this, that even as we are broken, we are whole. Even as we are shattered, our intention, our purpose, our meaning remains intact. We still serve. This is so important to understand this holding of two profound truths, broken and whole, because you see underneath that bigger question of what's the point of happiness when evil, cruel, bad, horrific things happen, when children are starving, you know, what is the point of all that? Underneath that big question is a much more personal question. How do I possibly love my life? How do I possibly love this life with my fractures, with my frailties, with my faults, with my wounds, with my, you know, crazy, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all a little crazy, we're all a little crazy. My, my crazy, you know, like how that thing I did years ago that I still can't quite forgive myself for with the cellulite and the age spots and the hair growing on me. You know, like how do I possibly love this life? 
And I suggest to you that choosing happiness, choosing states of laughter, of compassion, of kindness, of awe, of putting ourselves in the presence of wonder, of generosity, of beauty, builds hope, creates respite, offers us a resilient pathway in which we can find both the will and the way to hold ourselves as broken and whole at the exact same time. There is no other way. There is no other way if we are here, as everyone in this room is here, to create a little less harm and a little more good in our planet. On the day my brother died, the air was lit with spring. I wish for you the same. Aloha. Bonjour. Namaste.